welcome aboard Just Jets with your captain, Matt O'Leary. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Hello and welcome to Just Jets episode number 124. What is going on? I am Matt O'Leary back talking to you on a Thursday. I know that's weird. I'll explain why in a second. Before we get started today, you guys know the drill. Wherever you listen to the show, please make sure to subscribe. Give a rating review really helps out a lot. Leave a comment, all that fun stuff. We'll be getting into a few different things. We're going to talk about Quinn Williams not being listed as a top 10 defensive tackle. We'll talk about Michael Carter being elusive and of course, getting into your voicemails. But before we get started today, a word from our sponsor. Hey, you. Yeah, you. You got Bush. You definitely do. If you haven't tried the best products from our sponsor today, Manscaped. Take control of your bush. It's important. These products are so good. You're going to be showing pride in your new bush free yard. It's a fact that you will have the best kept nut sack on the cul-de-sac. How about that? Save big and be the most hygienic version of yourself by using our discount code here. Jets 20. That is J E T S two zero for 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. You can pick yourself up something nice. Take care of yourself. It's important. It's the summer. Keep that body looking good and feeling fresh with Manscaped. And use my promo code, Jets20, here to help you out and get a nice discount. So a few things, a little some housekeeping stuff, and then we're going to get into uh, the episode. So first and foremost, it's a Thursday. Where, where, what happened? Where was I? Okay. So for, over the weekend, it was obviously the 4th of July, and I took some very much needed time off. Um, I haven't done a video since last Friday or Saturday, maybe, um, just needed a little bit of a mental reset. It's okay. Comes up every once in a while. Um, it's important to take time for yourself and, you know, reset here as things are about to ramp up with training camp coming. And then it's going to be, I don't know, a 10 month sprint, something along those lines until the end of the draft. So needed a little bit of a factory reboot there. Uh, so got, got away. Um, it was very nice. Enjoyed some time with family and friends and the girlfriends. So all was good. But I wanted to do an episode. Didn't want to go a whole week without doing one. So moved it to Thursday. We'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming on Monday coming up. So you get a little bit of a quick turnaround, but wanted to get something out. Uh, also, before we get into the episode, you guys should know about the Jets Lounge. If you don't check them out on Twitter, they do Twitter spaces consistently all the time it's it's a ton of fun i was on there a few weeks ago they have a ton of special guests popping in uh sack exchange over there at jets lounge and the rest of the guys are awesome and uh next week i believe next week on wednesday the 13th yeah that would be next week jeremy ruckert is doing a signing here on long island myself and jets media are going to be there uh so if you're interested uh, Jeremy Ruckert obviously is going to be doing the signing. His dad's going to be there. Uh, I'm going to be there. Richie from Jets Media is going to be there. I believe Richie and I are talking about live streaming during the event too. Uh, so we'll be hanging out. Uh, super excited to do the meet and greet and uh, hang out with uh, Jeremy Ruckert, our, one of our newer New York Jets. So tickets are still available, so make sure to check that out. And uh, yeah, come hang with us. It should be a really fun time. So uh, check it out if you're interested. Let's talk about Quinn Williams, who was not listed as a top 10 defensive tackle, according to Jeremy Fowler of ESPN. Now, a lot of people, not all, but there are a lot of people who said this list is is bogus. There's no way like Quinn has to be a top 10 defensive tackle. And he was not even an honorable mention. He was pretty far down on this list. But I mean, just off the top of my head here. I could list off some guys who are, you know, better than Quentin Williams on the interior. And I got Aaron Donald, Cam Hayward, Chris Jones, DeForest Buckner, uh, Jeffrey Simmons, Jonathan Allen, Vita Vey, Kenny Clark, Grady Jarrett, Fletcher Cox, Akeem Hicks, Christian Wilkins. That's what, 12, 13 guys. I think, you know, maybe around somewhere around the 15 mark plus or minus. I mean, you could, you could debate after that where Quinnen comes in, but I think the main point here is in year four for Quinnen Williams, it's a massive, massive year for a ton of reasons. Number one, he has to cement himself as a top 10 guy. I think he needs to find his name on this list. When we're talking about this stuff at this time next year, 
Um, I would love to see Quinn Williams' name in this list or on this list here. Um, and there's no reason to think that he can't make that jump with the improved defensive line around him. Carl Lawson screaming off the edge, Jermaine Johnson, Vinnie Curry, Bryce Huff, all those guys who are going to be rotating around on the other side should really help the pass rush. And then the quarterbacks are going to be stepping up into the pocket, which is where Quinn and Williams should feast in theory, right? Him and John Franklin Myers should be able to get after the quarterback from the interior. And you would hope with, you know, a little bit of increased in production that Quinnen's going to find himself on this list. Now, he's obviously looking for he's going to be looking to get paid after this year. I mean, this, this is how it goes. They picked up the fifth year option. I think he'll play out the year. I don't expect him to get a new contract until the end of the year. Uh, and it's going to be dependent. He's going to get paid dependent on his performance for this year. If he's, you know, more of the same, which is he's a good to very good player. I think it's the inconsistencies from him that keep him off of these top 10 lists because there's weeks where, you know, he looks downright phenomenal. He looks like a, a, a blossoming star. And then he goes quiet for three or four weeks in a row, has a big game and then goes quiet again. Uh, so I think for Quinn, it's just a little bit of getting that consistency down, right? Because for him, we know the talent is there. He was a top three pick for a reason, but uh, I'm not going to say Quinn and Williams a bust, but at the same time, I don't think you are misguided if you're saying that you would like to see more out of Quinn and Williams. I think that's fair and reasonable. And again, I think a reasonable expectation is for him to be a top 10 interior defensive tackle in this league. And right now he's not. I agree with Jeremy Fowler. I don't I do not think that he is a top 10 player at that position. All those guys I just listed off, um, mm -hmm. I think, are better than him so i don't see him as a uh as someone who is on that list currently but a big year changes all of that and you know everyone was hyped about quinny williams going into last year because he was going to be playing with carl lawson well lawson missed the entire year due to injury and they had pretty much a non-existent edge rush once bryce huff went down who he missed a ton of time as well and yeah john franklin myers moved outside but I mean, I think you guys know how I feel about JFM. I think he's better suited rushing from the interior. Uh, and it was, you know, trading for Shaq Lawson was the the fix at edge. And I like the swing. I like the idea because you were, you know, a little bit desperate. But it just, it, the edge presence wasn't there last year and it affected Quinnen. Um, you know, I thought he looked significantly better as a sophomore. I think 2020 was by far his best year. Um, but he needs to take a significant jump, jump forward if he wants that mega contract coming up here in a little bit. The second thing that I wanted to get to here in the monologue, we're going to do two storylines and then get into voicemails. It's a little bit of a quiet week with voicemails, which is, is which is understandable because I wasn't around a lot. It was a holiday weekend. So I wanted to talk about Michael Carter and his elusiveness. Uh, according to Pro Football Focus, they rate or they track, I guess is a better way to, to word it how many missed tackles that they the running backs create. And he was third in the NFL, uh, forcing 39 missed tackles for a rate of 0 0.265 per attempt. So obviously this is based on the attempt. And he was third in the NFL at 0 0.265 uh, missed tackles forced per attempt. Uh, it was Javante Williams one, Kareem Hunt, and then Michael Carter. Um, and I think that kind of just goes to show you how he's still going to be a useful part of this offense. They didn't draft Brees Hall and then they're just going to kick Michael Carter to the curb. I don't think that's going to be the case at all. Now, I think Brees Hall is going to get more of the reps. If you were to you know, do a, a pie chart percentage, Brees Hall's probably going to be around that 60%, I would guess. And then Michael Carter is maybe around 30 and then 10% uh, for Tevin Coleman and the rest of the crew at that point. Um, but... Carter is going to be a useful piece in this offense. Um, I, I think it's important to have a plethora of backs who you trust. Uh, for instance, I mean, you look at all these other teams. Uh, Javante Williams was in a running back system that had a nice one-two punch. Cream Hunt obviously is a part of a nice one-two punch. In San Francisco for years and years and years, they've gotten by with multiple running backs. Hell, even when Kyle Shanahan, which we know this offense is very similar to the one that Shanahan was running, we know how much Mike LaFleur... Uh, has been you know attached to the hip of Kyle Shanahan previously to getting this job. When he was in Atlanta, 
they had the one-two punch, and Ken, and Tevin Coleman was the was the number two in, in twenty sixteen when they went to the Super Bowl. Uh, it, it was Devonta Freeman and uh, Tevin Coleman was the one-two punch, and it worked really well. Um, and again, like we don't necessarily have to see a repeat of the exact same statistical season for Michael Carter because I don't know if he's going to get the same amount of touches. So I don't know if he hits six hundred rushing yards, but he's going to be a factor and. I think, you know, God forbid, if Brees Hall gets banged up, then you could rely on Michael Carter and run him a little bit more um, and, and give some rest to Brees instead of having someone who you're just going to pound right into the ground. Like even last year, I thought Tevin Coleman had had more in the tank than I was anticipating. He was pretty good. Um, beyond that, who knows what I mean? Ty Johnson really struggled last year. Um I don't think Michael P. Ryan is going to be around much longer here, but the one-two punch of Brees and Michael Carter is really exciting, and I think it's going to show, which ironically, in, in a little bit here, we'll get into the first voicemail, which is, has to do with the running game. I, I think their plan on offense is going to be to, I don't want to say like a run first, because to me that implies, when I think run first, I think of like Tennessee with Derrick Henry. And I don't necessarily think it's going to be like that, but I think... They're going to establish the run, as cliche as that is, and build the passing attack off of that. So a lot of play action. I mean, like like West Coast offenses, play, play action, a lot of stuff over the middle. And then you have the playmakers now with a second year Elijah Moore, with Garrett Wilson added to the bunch, where you have the big play threat. And with Zach Wilson's arm, we know he has the ability to get the ball down the field. That's not going to be an issue with Zach Wilson, the the arm strength to get the ball down the field. You have the big play ability, so it could take that offense to the next level. And if everything clicks, this offense has a chance to be a lot of fun this year. And I hope Jeff fans realize that. And again, a lot has to break right. Obviously, we are hoping that these young guys take that next step in their development. I think they do. I am very confident in Zach. I'm confident in Michael Carter, Brees Hall. I'm confident in Elijah Moore and, uh, you know, all these guys. I, I think they take a step forward. I really like what Mike LaFleur did. I really like the depth that this offense has. I think the offensive line could be really, really good. It's going to be, the the run game is going to be so important to this. It's going to play into it. And like we saw early on in Mark Sanchez's career, how much a run game impacted the offense. Their offense was successful when they were running the football. And, and obviously, this offensive line isn't in the same stratosphere as that 2009-2010 offensive line, which is a, a, a phenomenal without, like, far and away the number one offensive line in football in those years, right? But at this point right now, they're pushing a top 10 unit if Becton's back and healthy and, you know, playing on the right side or wherever, on the left or the right side, doesn't matter, but... The point being, they have a chance to have a really good offensive line. They have a chance to have a really good run game. And in theory, that should make your life easier for your young quarterback. I, I know it feels like I'm a broken record here. And we talk about Zach every single week. But that's what this conversation is going to come around to every single time is because you have no idea. As of right now, even the highest the people who are the highest on Zach Wilson it's not based on the stat production from last year, right? It's on what we think he can be. Well, trying to make Zach the best version of himself and by putting these pieces around him is going to give him the best shot to succeed. We know how badly they messed up with Sam Darnold. Joe Douglas is not making that same mistake. Michael Carter's elusiveness plays a big factor in it. The fact that he is RB2 means a lot. I mean, we're not that far removed from Sam Darnold having like these no-name guys. Uh, La Michael Pirine as, as RB2 paired up with Frank Gore in 2020. Gross. Gr that's pretty gross. Or even in Darnold's rookie year. Uh, it was Bilal Powell at first, who and you guys know how I feel about Bilal, but Isaiah Crowell had like one good game. Powell gets hurt. And before you know it, at the end of the year, you had, uh, oh my God, what was, I almost said Elijah Moore, but that's not who it is. Oh, what was that guy's name? Come on, the that running back that they drafted. Oh God, I'm going to have to look this up because this is going to kill me. Hang on. He was a rookie that year too, if I'm not, in 2017. Let's do Jets, draft, classes. Please hold. You're screaming at your computer or your phone wherever you listen to this. Elijah McGuire. See, I knew it was an Eli, an Elijah. I couldn't think of the last name. Elijah McGuire played two years in the league. 
276 rushing yards and three touchdowns. That 2018 Jets, man, that was tough. Well, who was their leading rusher? I guess in, it was probably ended up being Isaiah Crowell, but he was not very good outside of that one monster game. It was 685 yards, six touchdowns was a leading rusher. Powell only played seven games. He was good, of course, in those seven games, but... Yeah, it's different. It's different this time around. And hopefully the wins come and hopefully the leap from the quarterback comes because that's what's most important. Without further ado, let's get into those voicemails. First up, we're going to go to Main Jet talking about the running game. Let's do it. Hi, Matt. This is Main Jet. What's up? I had a question, and I think this is a rather interesting topic. Assuming all five of our starters on the offensive line stay healthy, would we be able to play some ground and pound uh, this season? Now, I think that's their niche to get started because obviously um, Zach Wilson still, he's kind of a, a wild card in all of this. But the offensive line, the five starters, I look at them, and obviously I do not think that they're as good as the 2009 uh, offensive line was. But once they get going, they get polished, they create chemistry with each other. I think that's their niche, and I think they could catch some of the good teams, you know, i.e. like the the Green Bay Packers, the Denver Broncos, Buffalo. Um, Catch them by surprise by taking, just saying that we're going to play smash mouth football, um, try to possess the ball every time we have it for at least, say, eight eight minutes or more, and just carry carry the game away. Now, um, I wanted to know what your thoughts are and whether you think that that's possible. Anyway, J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 take care and hope to hear. Bye. Thank you, Main Jet. Appreciate it. And yeah, when I think of those ground and pound years, I think more specifically 2009. 2010 was pretty ground and pound, but that 2009 Jets team, they ran the ball for a league leading 607 attempts, 607 My God, that is a lot of attempts. 21 rushing touchdowns, too, by the way. For context, the following season, 2010, they still ran the ball a good deal, but I don't think it was nearly as much. It wasn't. They were at 534 in 2010. Still a lot, which was second in the league behind the Kansas City Chiefs. But last year, the Tennessee Titans ran the ball the most at 551 attempts. Uh, You had the Eagles at 550, Ravens 517, Saints 510. That rounds up. And then the Colts were 499 and San Fran was 499. I fully expect the Jets to be top five to seven in rushing attempts this year. I I would say that would count in my eyes as as. I don't know if I'd go as far as say grounded pound, but I think they're going to, as I said earlier, I think they are going to try to run the ball and establish the run here. Uh, Cleveland's another team that ran the ball a lot. 485, they came in ninth. New England, 489, was eighth in the league. They're going to run it a lot. The Jets ran it only 380 times, which was the fewest in the NFL. A lot of that has to do with they were playing behind in the games a lot. Their defense was atrocious, so they were trying to play catch up. Um, and they didn't obviously didn't run a ton of plays either. But I would anticipate the Jets running the ball probably pretty close to 500 times this year. That would be my guess. I think they're probably pushing somewhere around 500, um, which they haven't done, hit that number in a long time uh if if i had to guess let's try to let's see the last time the jets hit 500 this might take a while here 2020 i mean they ran the ball right into the line of scrimmage it felt like but they also were playing from behind 406 they were 22nd in the league in 2020 2019 i don't anticipate this number being very high either let's see oh god 383 They were 26th in the league in rushing attempts that year. 2018, Darnold's rookie year. Again, don't think this number is going to be very high at all. Uh, Let's see. Oh, a little higher than I anticipated. 410. So right at the the middle of the pack. 2017 might be a little bit higher if I had to guess. The Jets' offense was surprisingly like semi-functional before the Josh McCown injury. 
Um, where the heck are the Jets in here? Middle of the pack, 427. It might be t- like 2011 the last time the Jets are that high. Oh, maybe not. Maybe in 2015 because they ran a lot of plays. They were 13th at 418 in 2016. 2015, again, this was when the Jets' offense was one of the best offenses in the league. They were 10th at 448. Man, it's probably going to be since 2010, maybe 2011. Oh, no. Nope. 507. Fourth in the league in rushing attempts in 2014. There you go. Rex's last year. Twenty The 2014 Jets ran the ball 507 times. And their leading rusher was... Did they have a 1,000-yard rusher? No, they didn't. They had Chris Ivory go for 821. Ivory was... He was good, man. Chris Johnson went for 663. Geno Smith, 238. Bilal Powell, they did not use. He ran the ball 33 times for 141 yards. That's just bizarre. But yeah, 2014 was the last time they went over 500 rushing attempts. And uh, I think they have a good chance to hit that number this year. So that's a little bit closer to ground and pound. Will is calling in from Dallas. He wants to go into uh, some social media stuff. Okay, let's do it. Hey, Matt. Will calling from Dallas. Uh, my throat's a little sore, so hopefully everything is uh, clear on what I'm saying. But um, I, I guess my question for this week is, I I mean, I hate Woody and Christopher Johnson as much as the next guy. They're, they're one of the worst owners in sports. Um, I've always kind of compared them to whoever owns the Pittsburgh Pirates because they just don't seem to care about how well the team does. They just care that they're making their money. Um, so my question is, like, why Why do you think it is that all of a sudden they're, they're upping their presence on social media, they're on Twitter more, they're on TikTok of all places, and it seems like we're finally headed in the right direction. Do you think that they just happen to get lucky with Joe Douglas, or what? Do you, what do you think the the change has been that has them so much more involved lately? Um, I also wanted to just thank you for uh, all the all the work that you put in, everything that you, you do for the show. Um, I've been watching this show since. I was 19 years old. I've been calling in since I was 19 years old. I'm turning 22 this year. It's been one of the most uh, consistent things in my life. Um, I listen to one podcast every week. I don't really have time to listen to more than one podcast, and yours is the one I watch every single week. Um, So I just wanted to thank you for your consistency, the work you put in, um, building this however big, however small, this tight-knit community that uh, really gives me you know, an outlet to talk about the Jets. My, most of my family doesn't care about football. They don't care about the Jets. So um, listening to the show every week and, and hearing everybody's questions, hearing your thoughts, it really gives me some kind of outlet just to, to talk about the Jets in even the smallest way. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to thank you. Um, make sure you understand that, like, how, how appreciated everything you do is. Um, but yeah, that's really all I had for you. And uh, as always, go Jet. Thank you, Will. That really means a lot to me. I appreciate that. That really that hit me. That that's awesome. You were 19 when you first started calling in. You're 20. You're about to be 22 now. It's it's crazy. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. I wouldn't be able to do this without you. I, I've said a million times. But my goal is eventually to get to the point where this is my full time job. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to do that without your help, the the, the views and the support. It it, it matters to me, and it, it, I'm very humbled by it, and I appreciate that, Will. Um, as far as the, the social media presence is funny, um, I think it has to do with money, I, honestly. Like, why else would you, like, building the brand and, and money, like Woody Johnson being on Twitter and being on TikTok, what other reason is there and i don't i don't necessarily agree with the pittsburgh pirates comparison because the jets the issue never was that they weren't going to pay for something or pay for a player 
uh, where the the pirates are like always one of the bottom teams in payroll. Like their their owners won't put money into it, um, and unfortunately, like there aren't really too many New York teams where it's like their their owners won't spend money. But there's bad owners for other reasons. I guess the the Will Ponds would have been an example of that in the later years after the uh, that scandal that they went through with Bernie Madoff. Uh, the Islanders before their new ownership, um, they were a team that was just fighting to reach the the payroll floor. It, for the Johnsons, it was never that they didn't want to spend. It was that they were doing dumb things by getting involved for and forcing his hands for the the public the headlines like uh would he being very involved to get tim tebow in here would he being very involved to get brett Favre in here um just all different i mean there's so many so many things that they've gotten involved with and probably have i don't know over overstepped their boundaries their issue is that they need to hire the football people and let them do football things. And my hope is that they finally have this with Joe Douglas. He's done a lot to like. Uh, and for the most part, the Johnsons have kind of a little bit of a step back and being so hands on in that aspect. But I agree their social media presence has been uh, much more noticed recently. And uh, I think it all goes back down to money and marketability and, and that stuff. So um yeah, thank you for the call, Will. Appreciate it. Glad that you checked in this week. We have another legend, someone who's been following us around for a while. Travis from Ohio is back. He wants to talk about the age on this Jets team. Hey, Matt. Yo. Travis from Ohio. Hey, buddy. Uh was just looking at our the ages on our roster. We actually got younger from last year. Check this out. Joe Flacco is 37. He's the old man river. <laughs> and you got Vinny Curry and Greg Zerline at 34. And Zerline's a specialist. He's a kicker. He ain't getting hit. Curry, rotational, lesser role, plus didn't play last year. There's some tread on the tire there. Marcus Joyner is 31. Did not play last year also. Same kind of boat as Curry. Might be rotational. At least he's a veteran. C.J. Mosley, as much as people think he's old, he's our last 30-year-old on the team um, as of right now. Then you got Tevin Coleman, C.J. Ozoma, uh, Connor McGovern, George Fant, and Connor McDermott that are all 29. Everybody else is younger. That's insane. This team is super young. It's deeper than it has been in ages. Um Except that maybe linebacker and safety that we all agree upon. But at this point, it's pretty much up to the coaching staff to develop these guys that Douglas brought in because, like, and for Zach to take the step forward that we all want him to because there isn't a whole lot of excuses now. you got a young roster. Hopefully we don't see injury like we have in the past, past couple of yeah. years. So, anyway... Happy fourth. Love you, buddy. Bye. Go Th Jets. Thank you, Travis. Hope you had a good fourth. Uh, hope all you guys had a good fourth. Uh, I like this point that you bring up is that they are very youthful, except for like if your backup quarterback is one of the oldest guys and like your kicker, like I think you're in pretty good shape there because this team has the potential to grow along with Zach Wilson. Um, you have the odd complaints that the Jets – are they have too much youth and they're going to have to pay all these guys at the same time. That sounds like a first world problem because the Jets haven't had anyone to pay. Um, they haven't because of terrible, terrible, terrible drafting. So that would be a good problem to have if all these guys hit and you're trying to pay them. But, you know, as, as a group, you have most, of, most of your veterans are at the like 29, 30 years old, as you mentioned, mostly, uh, and McGovern, who they still have got things left in the tank. Um, they have still have some juice left. Um, the I talked about it on Exit 16 West last week with uh, James. Was with C.J. Mosley, if he's a guy where if he got hurt and had to miss time, that would really, really suck because I don't like the depth beyond him at that at that position. The, the Jets linebacker depth is definitely questionable. 
Uh, keep an eye on Quan Alexander, I guess, there. But overall, the 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 youthfulness of this team, it's gonna be it's gonna make it more fun to watch because at least like if there's times where they're struggling, you know like what this thing could look like if it hits right. In years gone by, like yeah, in 2020, they were kind of young. They did have some kind of young ex- young pieces, but by the end, every, the writing was on the wall with Darnold, uh, and he was hurt and missed time. So you're watching, you know, Joe Flacco in 2020 play, which wasn't. I mean, that was he was fine, but it just felt like a waste of time. Uh, and outside of that, like it was Flacco and Frank Gore when there was an injury, like what? And you won two games. That's, I could not wish upon a a worse possible scenario on anyone than having to watch Adam Gase, Joe Flacco at, at that point, 35 and Frank Gore on his last leg week in and week out. And Greg Williams just being Greg Williams. Um, It's crazy to see how far they've come along in just a short amount of time. But this young team should be a lot of fun in 2022. And I'm looking forward to it. Last one is Richard from Nevada. And we are going to talk about a challenge that he has for me. All right, let's do it. Hey there, Matt. It's Richard from Nevada once again. How are you doing? Good, sir. So uh, I've been I've been trying to pitch this idea to various uh, YouTubers that deal with the Jets and uh, a lot of Jets fans in general. Um, I think one problem with the Jets, at least as far as us as fans, is that we don't fire back enough at the critics when they say stupid stuff about us. So I have an idea. I have a challenge. If you're, if you're willing to participate in this one to all Jets fans, not just the YouTubers and all that, open up a word document or an Excel spreadsheet or whatever you want to do it with something to write it down, write down all the stupid stuff they say about the Jets. Ah, the Jets are going to go three and 14. Ah, the Jets are just automatically going to lose the Packers. Oh, on week six. Oh, the the Jets are already a bust. We already know what we have. We have diamonds ready to be created under pressure. And so I want to have this all written down. The, The who, what, when, where, and why. When they said it, what they said, who said it. After the end of this year, let's see how correct they were. So if the Jets win six games, let's let's be generous and say the Jets are that bad and they only win six games. Okay. We're still twice as correct as the morons at these like big publications saying the Jets only are gonna win three games. Let's let's start firing bat chicks, uh Jets fans. <laughs> let's let's stop, you know, taking this sitting down. Anyway, Matt, I hope you had a happy fourth. Thank you. Love you, love your content. Subscribe, hit the bell, etc. Everybody listening currently <laughs> Go Jets, J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. Let's go, boys. Let's go. Thank you, man. I like this challenge. I do like this challenge. I don't have the the time or mental capacity to do, to do that. But if someone has the free time on their hands and they want to do it, I'm for it. I, I would like an old takes exposed Jets. Uh, I would be a little bit nervous because I've had some misses. And I'll be the first to tell you about those misses. Um I was. I really thought Sam Donald was going to be the answer. Uh, I was a big Denzel Mims fan, so we'll see if he bounces back this year. But that wasn't looking too good after his second year in the league. Um, what else we got? Braxton Barrios last year. Um, what else? There's got to be. There's there's tons of more, and I'm sure people in the comments will remind me, but. Yeah, like I don't, I don't know. I'd be, I'd find myself on that list for some of my takes that I've gotten wrong, and I am far from perfect. I am just trying to. I've my goal all along with this channel is just to, I don't know, just an avenue for my thoughts. I never claim to be to know more than anyone else. I never claim to uh, be more correct than anyone else. Like I don't know. I just wanted a place for Jeff fans to hang out and discuss the team. That's what we're doing here. So. Yeah, but I don't like the the overly negative. You're right. You have a good point there. So if someone wants to carry that along and get it over to Richard in Nevada, I'm for it. 
I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely for it. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, give a rating review really helps me out a lot. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video, leave a comment, share it with a friend. Appreciate all the love and support. Once again, I am Matt O'Leary. This has been Just Jets episode number 124. I'll talk to you next time.